Okay, as we saw, there are reasons to go beyond sentential logic. So, without further ado, let's introduce predicate logic, abbreviated here as PL. It is also known as quantificational logic or as first order logic. In this first part of our introduction, we're going to deal with the syntax of PL sentences, that is to say, with their structure and the way in which they are put together, regardless of their meaning or interpretation, which is a matter for semantics. PL has basically three types of building blocks for constructing sentences predicates, terms, and quantifiers. In their turn, terms can be divided into variables and names or individual constants. Predicates are represented by uppercase letters from A to Z, and they are also associated with a given number of places, which are also called arguments, in a different sense that, confusingly enough, has nothing to do with the way in which we use the word to designate sequences of premises and conclusions. However, you might have encountered this use in programming languages, where the number and type of arguments of a function are simply the number and types of inputs it takes. In any case, we can see this phenomenon in English. For example, the predicate is tall has only one place, reserved for the object or person that is said to be tall. So we say that is tall is a one place or monadic predicate. This single gap left open by the predicate can be filled by individual names, such as Al to form the sentence Al is tall, or by Beth, yielding Beth is tall, or Claire, which gives Claire is tall. In English, they don't have to be proper nouns. They could be entire phrases, such as the carpenter from Des Moines. The predicate rides, in one of its uses at least, has two places, one for the writer and the other for whatever it is that is being written. So it is a two-place or dyadic predicate. We can fill the first gap with the name Al and the second one with the phrase the horse to form the phrase Al rides the horse. Or we could add the pair the jockey and Seabiscuit or, more classically, Bellerophon and Pegasus. We also have three-place predicates in English, which accordingly are called triadic predicates. An example of this is X invites Y to Z, as in Al invited Beth to the movies. Predicates in PL can be described in a similar way. You can have one-place predicates, which we signal here with a letter followed by a single gap. For instance, we could use the letter T to stand for the English predicate X is tall. Notice that here the letter T is used to represent part of a sentence, not a whole sentence. We can also have two-place predicates, such as R followed by two separate gaps, which could be a stand-in in our system for X writes Y. We could also have a three-place predicate, such as I followed by three different gaps in the manner of X invited Y to Z, and so on. In principle, there is no upper limit to the number of argument places that a PL predicate can assign. Here, you could make up a predicate with a thousand places, which would certainly have no counterpart in English, but who knows, could be useful for some crazy project. A terminological point, a predicate with two or more places is called a relation. So, the first predicate in this list is not a relation, but the other two are. Now let's talk about terms. Terms occupy the argument places specified by predicates. So a monadic predicate must be followed by one term. A dyadic predicate must be followed by two terms, and so on. In predicate logic, there are two kinds of terms. There's names, also known as individual constants, and there's variables. Names, or individual constants, are represented by lowercase letters taken from the alphabet. In the system we're studying, we can use the letters from A to R. And if you need more names, say for your thousand place predicate, you can add subindices to those letters. Names can combine with predicates to form sentences. You do this by writing to the right of the predicate letter as many names as the predicate assigns places. For instance, our predicate T, or tall, assigns only one place. So to form a sentence, we add one name. Suppose that J is John, then TJ would be the symbolization of the English sentence John is tall. R, which we are using to stand for rides, assigns two places. So to form a sentence, we write two names, one for the writer and the other one for what the writer rides. Then our BS could symbolize Beth rides Seabiscuit. I assigns three places, one for each of the participants in the event of inviting someone to something. So we have three names, and then we could represent Fred invites Simone to Rome. 
By distinguishing within a sentence between predicates and terms, we can capture a larger number of natural language expressions that we could in sentential logic. Now we can account for the difference between atomic sentences involving monadic predicates and atomic sentences containing relations of different orders. SL, on the other hand, sees only one kind of sentence. Likewise, PL can distinguish between sentences that only have names and sentences that contain quantification, which, as we'll see, is also crucial for the validity of certain arguments. These distinctions allow us to account for the validity of more and more argument forms. In PL, sentences formed by a predicate, followed by the appropriate number of names, qualify as atomic sentences. Here are some examples. As such, these atomic sentences can be compounded with the connectives of sentence logic, like this. So you can see that the rules of sentential logic are fully incorporated into predicate logic. Now let's talk briefly about the other kind of term, the variable. Variables are represented by lowercase letters taken from the end of the alphabet, such as x, y, z. Whereas a name can only take one value in a given interpretation, a variable can take many. But we'll see this in more detail when we talk about semantics. In predicate logic, variables are usually introduced together with quantifiers. And why do we need quantifiers? Well, not all sentences are about specific individuals. Some are interpreted in a general way. For instance, a sentence like, everything is illuminated, is not about any specific thing that is illuminated, like a house on an empty street or the assassination of JFK. Rather, the sentence is general. It is about the totality of things in a given domain of discourse. Likewise, a sentence like, someone is singing, is not necessarily about some specific individual we might have in mind. These kinds of sentences have a paraphrase that uses the is such that locution. These paraphrases are a bit awkward and unnatural sounding, but they form a nice bridge between English and predicate logic. So everything is illuminated can be paraphrased as everything is such that it is illuminated. Someone is singing can be reworded as someone is such that she, he, they is singing. Take your pick. Still further from everyday English, we can substitute the expressions I emphasize here, such as the pronouns and pronoun-like uses of words, by occurrences of variables. So everything is illuminated ends up as every x is such that x is illuminated. And someone is singing is rendered as some x is such that x is singing. We can identify two parts in the previous sentences. The first one consists in a quantifier, an expression like some or every, followed by a variable. The other is a long-winded version of a predicate that contains the expression is such that and the same variable that appears with a quantifier. Let's stick with the first part. In predicate logic, quantifying expressions such as every and all are symbolized with this upside-down A. This is called the universal quantifier. Some and at least one are represented by the backwards E symbol, which we call the existential quantifier. The quantifier and the variable form a unit which in our version of PL comes in these two varieties, the universal and the existential. So let's now turn to the second part of our paraphrase. Take the first sentence. In place of is such that x is illuminated, we can simply write a predicate letter followed by a variable, such as ix. And is such that x is singing can be replaced by sx. Putting the two parts together, we have the following PL symbolizations. Every x is such that x is illuminated is universal quantifier x i x. Some x is such that x is singing is existential quantifier s x. So we saw how, by a series of steps, we can go from an idiomatic English sentence to a completely symbolic expression in PL. Soon you'll forget about all these intermediate steps, which were there just to help you make sense of the symbolization we are using and you'll go from English to PL in a single bold step. Okay, let's get a little more terminology out of the way. We'll start with the important notion of the scope of a quantifier, and then we'll introduce the idea of variable binding. Here we'll just mention these concepts, and in a future lesson, we'll review them more carefully. We say that a quantifier governs or has scope over the shortest sentence which follows it. So in this sentence, the scope of the universal quantifier is TX, which is the only sentence, and therefore the shortest sentence, that follows it. But if we add more symbols, in this case a horseshoe and an atomic sentence, 
then the sentence FA falls outside of the quantifier scope. As you can see, TX is shorter than if TX, then FA, since TX is a proper part of the second sentence. So the shortest sentence following the quantifier is TX, and thus it is the only sentence that is within the quantifier scope. It is as if the occurrence of a connective after TX, which is the first smallest complete sentence after the quantifier, forms a barrier or a fence delimiting the quantifier scope. However, there is a simple way to bring the whole of if TX then FA within the scope of the quantifier, just by enclosing it in parentheses. Of course, exactly the same notion of scope applies to the existential quantifier. In this case, just for variety's sake, I'm using Y as a variable. And you can see that, thanks to the parentheses, the conjunction TY and KY is within the scope of the quantifier. The notion of quantifier scope allows us to introduce the idea of binding in this way. If an occurrence of a variable is within the scope of a quantifier, and if that occurrence is of the same letter as the occurrence of the variable that accompanies the quantifier, then that occurrence is said to be bound by the quantifier. So if we assign numbers to the occurrences of the variable y, just to help us keep track of things, we can see that the second and third occurrences of y are within the scope of the existential quantifier and share the same variable letter, that is y. Therefore, both of these occurrences are bound by the quantifier to the left. On the other hand, if a variable is not bound by a quantifier, then it is free. In this example, the second occurrence of y is within the scope of the existential quantifier and is also of the same sentence letter. However, the occurrence of x is free. This is because, although it is in the scope of the quantifier, it doesn't have the right sentence letter. Here we have the opposite case. The third occurrence of y is free, because it falls outside the quantifier scope, thanks to the occurrence of the ampersand and the lack of parentheses. OK, we are ready to provide a definition of a PL sentence. Our definition is going to take the form of an answer to the question what counts as a PL sentence, which we'll provide in the form of a series of clauses. So what counts as a PL sentence? All predicate letters followed by the appropriate number of terms count as PL sentences. This includes sentence letters, which we met in sentential logic, as cases with zero terms. Thus, all these count as PL sentences. OK, what else is a PL sentence? Well, if x is a sentence of predicate logic and u is a variable, then every ux and some ux are sentences of predicate logic. This allows quantified sentences in PL as long as x is already a PL sentence. So clauses 1 and 2 complete the specification of an atomic sentence in PL. Moreover, if x and y are sentences of predicate logic, then any expression formed from x and y by using the connectives of sentence logic is a sentence of predicate logic. This allows for compound sentences like these. Finally, the previous three clauses exhaust the list of things that qualify as sentences in this system. Nothing else counts as a predicate logic sentence. Any expression formed in accordance with the rules 1 through 4 above is called the well-formed formula, abbreviated as WOOF. I'm not making this up, I'm trying to be funny. That's how people say it. The definition allows for sentences with free, that is, not bound, occurrences of variables. A sentence that has one or more free occurrences of variables is called an open sentence. This sentence is open because it has a free occurrence of the variable x. In contrast, those sentences that are not open are closed sentences. Here, all occurrences of variables are bound so this is a closed sentence. Okay, this is all for today. Bye.